Hey everybody, welcome to our chapter three lecture. Um, we uh, just got done taking a look at chapter two, which was our introduction to kind of basic chemistry, atomic structure, uh, bonding, some characteristics of water. Uh, so what chapter three does, it kind of takes some of those characteristics um, and we're gonna build those atoms into larger molecules. And these are molecules that are typically found in living things. Um, these are what we call biological molecules or organic molecules, um, macromolecules. There's going to be four major categories that we're going to be uh, focusing on in this chapter. Uh, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And what they all share is kind of a carbon skeleton is sometimes what it's called. So carbon is incorporated into all of these molecules. So first we're going to address why is carbon so important um, in all of these biological molecules. Just a little bit of a side note here. I record these lectures at home and I have two cats and they are currently walking around me right now. So um, if they try to jump up on my desk or my lap as I'm teaching, which they like to do when I'm at my desk, um, I might introduce them to you or you might hear them kind of fiddle around over there. So you may or may not get to see my cats during these lectures that I'm recording at home. Um, all right, so let's get into it. That first question, why is carbon so important since we have all of these molecules consist of a lot of carbon? Um, so first of all, we have to define the kind of the whole branch of chemistry um, based on these carbony molecules. Um, this is called organic molecules, and we studied those with organic chemistry. So basically, organic molecules are anything that contain carbon. Um, so usually it's a what we call a skeleton or a carbon backbone that other atoms might be bonded to that gives that um, molecule particular characteristics. And there is a lot of different types of organic molecules, so many, so many. Um, if you are talking about chemicals, molecules that do not contain carbon, they are called inorganic substances or inorganic molecules, with the exception of carbon dioxide, it does contain carbon, it's CO2, one carbon, two oxygens, but it kind of fits into that classification of an inorganic molecule. Um, all right. So the, one of the reasons why carbon is so important is because uh, it's very versatile in bonding. So you gotta remember um, when we were taking a look at atom atomic structure, protons, neutrons, and electrons, uh, the thing that gave the atoms their characteristic are those valence electrons. So they were in the outermost shell. And if you remember, carbon had four, right? So it had four electrons in its valence shell, so its bonding capacity was up to four bonds. It could make four single bonds, two double bonds, one single and three, and a triple bond. Um, so lots of different combinations. And um, with that, we could go in all different shapes. We'll, we'll be seeing some carbon chains, like a whole bunch of carbons uh, end to end in a row. Sometimes we'll see them as ringed shaped molecules. Sometimes we see single bonds, double bonds, and those are all going to give some um, specific characteristics to the molecules that contain those uh, kind of different carbon bonding. Another thing we're gonna take a look at is what are called functional groups. So functional groups are small little collections of atoms that always kind of travel together, um, and then they give certain characteristics, um, functional characteristics, to a basic carbon chain. So let's take a look at uh, some of that detail. So here we have, um, if you remember, a little bit of our covalent bonding. So here the first uh, molecule that we have is called methane. That's one carbon hooked to four hydrogen atoms. Um, so remember carbon, I just mentioned, they have four valence electrons. So they're trying to fulfill that octet um, stability goal that they're trying to get to. And hydrogen, remember, has one um, valence electron. So it's trying to get to its duplet, its rule of two, if you will. So looking at that first molecule of methane, we can see one carbon um, atom is in the middle with four hydrogen atoms bonded around it in a single bond. Uh, each single bond is representing two electrons that are shared. Um, and then we see carbon dioxide, so you can see where there are double bonds on each side of the carbon, um, sharing four electrons is a double bond. And then the last one is called hydrogen cyanide, uh, which is a very poisonous gas. And here is carbon, triple bonded to nitrogen, um, and single bonded to hydrogen. So just in that, those three examples, we can see the diversity and the variety of both the ways that carbon can bond to these different atoms. Um, so then over on the right, you can see those bonding capacities. I think we saw the same picture back in chapter two. Um, so hydrogen does single bonds. Carbons can do single, double, triple bonds. Nitrogen, triple bonds. Oxygen, single, 
um, or double bonds. And it's all based on those valence electrons. We can go back to review chapter two um, to see when that information was presented. All right, so let's take a look at some of these functional groups um, that can hook onto these carbon molecules, um, either an individual carbon or a carbon skeleton. Um, so what these functional groups basically are, as the kind of name implies, they're groups of atoms that kind of move and hook together. They don't really get broken apart in chemical reactions. They kind of stay clustered together as a group, um, and they give function to a particular carbon skeleton. So a whole bunch of carbons all by itself is a very boring molecule, if you will. It's nonpolar. There's equal sharing of all the electrons. If you have a whole bunch of carbons bonded together, um, there's no reactivity to it. Um, but then you can start sticking some of these functional groups onto those carbons, and then you start getting some different chemical characteristics. So as we go through these, just quickly recognize that we have functional groups. We'll be seeing them in some of our examples of organic molecules. I'll try to point those out um, as we see them in actual examples. So the first group is called a hydroxyl. It is just an oxygen covalently bonded to a hydrogen. Um, there's going to be some polar bond. It's a polar bond between the oxygen and hydrogen, very much like we saw with water. So it's going to make that, uh, it'll give a nonpolar carbon skeleton some polar property. So it will give it some partial positive and partial negative, which is gonna change how that molecule can function and behave in water and with other polar substances. Um, the next two are very similar. They're car the carbon carbonyl and the carboxyl group. If you'll notice, it's carbon bonded to two oxygens. Um, it all just kind of depends on where that bond is taking place. Um, sorry, carbon bonded to a single oxygen um, in the carbonyl. Uh, and then in the carboxyl group, the carbon double bonded to an oxygen and then another oxygen bound to that. Um, so these also, because you have oxygen, kind of steals those electrons from carbon. It also gives some polar properties um, wherever we find that carbonyl group. Um, and sometimes the carboxyl is called the carboxylic acid group um, because that OH minus, get my little pen here, this guy right here, can sometimes have a hydrogen uh, bonded to it. And when mixed with solution in water, it can give off that hydrogen um, ion. And so we learned in chapter two that anything that can release hydrogen ions into solution is considered an acid. So when you hook a carboxyl group onto a carbon skeleton, you've just made an acid. Uh, so things like acetic acid, vinegar, and citric acid like orange juice and lemon juice have their acidity because they have those carboxylic acid groups attached to their carbon skeletons. Uh, the amino is a nitrogen-containing functional group, so it's NH2. Um, so nitrogen is also kind of electron-hungry, so it will uh, steal some of those electrons away from the hydrogen, giving it polar properties, so it's going to be able to interact with water. Um, we see amino groups primarily on uh, amino acids, which is part of our protein macromolecule we'll be taking a look at shortly. Um, we see it in some nucleic acids like DNA and RNA and in some hormones. Um, the next one is called sulfhydryl. This is a sulfur, which we don't normally see that atom too much in um, organic molecules, but we see it a lot in proteins um, because it is found in the amino acid cysteine and very important in the three-dimensional folding of proteins, as we'll see here shortly. Uh, the next group is called a phosphate group. This is a really big functional group as far as size goes. It's got five atoms in it, one phosphorus atom in the middle with four oxygens bound around it, which can then bind to a carbon. Um, so phosphate groups in this ionized form means it's lost the hydrogen. So again, you, everywhere you see that negative ion right here, that could potentially hold hydrogens. So again, if you have something that mixes with solution, loses its hydrogen, um, it can form acids like we see here. Uh, nucleic acids, we have phosphate groups in nucleic acids. Um, and then the last one we have is methyl. So this is a nonpolar because it's carbon and hydrogen. Carbon and hydrogen equally share their electrons. There's, no, there's nobody hogging those electrons away from the hydrogen in this one. Um, so this is nonpolar. A lot of times it's found associated with DNA um, and on steroid hormones. So those are our functional groups. So as we start going through some of these more uh, macromolecules, I'll try, like I said, I'll try to point out some of these functional groups and remind you of some of their, their characteristics and what they can do and change the function of a basic carbon skeleton. 
Okay, so when we take a look uh, and talk about organic molecules inside of our cells, we'll be introducing cells here in chapter four, um, but these are large molecules. They're very complex. Um, they are usually what we call polymers, poly meaning many, um, and uh, they're made up of smaller subunits called monomers, and mono meaning one. Um, so a good analogy that you might be kind of thinking about when we are starting to talk about these large macromolecules uh, is think of like a train. So a train is one big unit, but it is broken up into the individual cars of the train. So you can kind of see that visual example there. So you might have a train polymer, which is made up of individual train car monomers. Um, so that's kind of the idea that we're going to be seeing. And all of our macromolecules will be looking at is kind of following that same pattern of large molecule made up of smaller uh, molecules smaller subunits. So how do we get these large molecules um, from these individual subunits? So just uh, there's a couple reactions I'm going to introduce here. So this first one is called dehydration synthesis. Now think about the word dehydration. Usually what we associate that with um, is losing water, right? You're, you're, you don't drink your water. It's a hot outside and you're sweating. You're getting dehydrated. Your body is losing water. So in this chemical reaction, the same thing happens is that we are going to make bonds, that's a synthesis part of this name, by removing water. So if we take a look here at this molecule, it's a two subunit, whatever, we don't even have a name for those blue hexagons, um, but we have two of them and one of them has a hydrogen sticking off of one side. And if we look over here, there's a single loner uh, hexagon, this blue hexagon, and it's got an OH hanging off of the opposite side. So what happens is these two things actually get removed, the OH and the H, which is basically water, H2O, and this bond here, I'm pointing and I'm not doing anything. So sorry, this hydrogen and this OH group sticking off of these two molecules um, get removed. It's an enzyme process, and we'll learn about enzymes a little bit later, but they get removed into this water molecule that we can see over here. My head's kind of blocking half of it. Um, and what we end up with is this new bond. So between this carbon, that would be sitting at that corner, and this carbon sitting at the corner of that molecule, this is where we see that new bond. So there's that one carbon, and there's the other bond, or the other carbon, and now we have this new bond because we removed the water, okay? So this is called a dehydration synthesis reaction. Here's just another representation of it, very generic, kind of a schematic. You have your short polymer with molecules, uh, subunits one, two, and three. Here's our unlinked individual uh, train car, if you will, this unlinked monomer. One side's got hydroxyl sticking off, the other side's got hydrogen sticking off, and enzyme's gonna remove that water. And here is our new bond between subunit three and what now is going to be subunit four. So whenever we are making these large macromolecules, we use this process called dehydration synthesis, okay? Now, what if we wanna break those down? Is there a reverse? Well, I'm glad you thought of that question because yes, there is. Um, so if we have large macromolecules that we wanna break down, say like you're eating sugar or I should say starch, like a potato or a piece of bread. Starch is a huge, one of these huge macromolecules of carbohydrate um, and we can't absorb that huge across our digestive epithelium. We need to break it down into this individual subunits, those monosaccharides. <clears throat> so we just kind of reverse the reaction. So again, here is our polymer, right? We have one, two, three molecules hooked in this chain. And so again, an enzyme, so this is a, a chemical little machine that can come in and trigger these chemical reactions. If we add water, we can break that bond. And so here the bond is broken right there. And uh, the hydrogen in the water gets added to one side of this now shorter polymer and the hydroxyl of the water gets added to the other side. Um, and then that similar kind of different schematic, here's our short polymer of four subunits which is then broken apart by adding water. And so the term that we use for this is called hydrolysis, hydro meaning water, and this root here, lysis, so we kind of split the word right in half there. So lysis means to break, to lyse. Um, and so hydrolysis or hydrolysis 
is a chemical reaction that breaks these covalent bonds between these um, subunits to release the individual subunit unattached from that polymer. Okay, so here is our kind of classification. So I said there's four major macromolecules, um, and a lot of them you might recognize as being found in food. So we have carbohydrates, things like uh, breads and grains and starches, potatoes, those types of things. Sugars are carbohydrates. Uh, we have lipids, like oils and fats and waxes. Uh, proteins, we might associate with uh, things like milk and meat and cheeses and eggs, um, have high content of proteins. And then lastly, we have nucleic acids, which usually aren't associated with nutrition, um, but most people know nucleic acids as your DNA, um, your blueprint, your master plan for all of your cells. But we don't really use that for nutrition, but it's still in this uh, kind of this category of these macromolecules. All right, so here's a table that you can take a look at in your book. Um, so this is on page 36 the four principal classes of biological molecules. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these with you. That's something that you can read through. It's a good kind of um, reference to go back to. Don't necessarily memorize everything, um, but just it gives you an overview, kind of some key details of each of the types of molecules. Okay, so we're going to start with carbohydrates first. So just like the name implies, carbo uh, is referencing carbon and hydrate is referencing, uh, referencing hydrogen. So carbohydrates are mainly carbon and hydrogen with some oxygen thrown in there. So usually um, the carbohydrates are, it, these three atoms are put together in a very specific ratio. Um, so usually carbon, hydrogen, oxygen in a one to two to one ratio. So for example, uh, this is glucose. So glucose is made up of six carbons. So in chemical formulas, you use a little subscript after the chemical symbol. So this lets us know we have six carbons. And then we have 12 hydrogens. I'm trying to do my best PowerPoint writing here. All right, so there's that one to two. So we have double hydrogens compared to our carbons. And then our oxygen, we also have six. So we have double hydrogens compared to the number of oxygens and carbons that we have. So whenever you see that chemical formula, C6, H12, O6, that is letting you know you're talking about glucose, which is one of the most common uh, sugars that we have out there. It is considered a monosaccharide, um, and it is in this ring form, so it looks like a little hexagon. Um, with those carbons, you can count the carbons, you can count the oxygens, you can count the hydrogens, and that's the formula you'll come up with, C6H12O6. Um, when you get two of these monosaccharides, mono meaning one, saccharide means sugar, when you get two of those hooked together, these are called disaccharides, di meaning two. So disaccharides would be things like um, lactose, sugar that is in your um, milk, or sucrose, which is table sugar that you find um, on your counter and in your cupboard. Uh, and then when you get a whole bunch of these um, saccharides hooked together, a whole bunch of the monosaccharides, you get what we call a polysaccharide, poly many saccharide sugar. So Monomer and polymer are general terms. Now that we're specifically looking at carbohydrates, we can call them monosaccharides and polysaccharides, specifically talking about those sugars. Okay, so what does our body use carbohydrates for? Primarily for energy. So when we are going to be talking about how our bodies uh, get energy from the food that we eat, we primarily get that from carbohydrates. It's a nice, quick energy store. There's a lot of energy stored in those covalent bonds between the carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. So our body has a great way of kind of breaking those down and stripping that energy away from the carbohydrates. Um, and so that is a major use of it in our body. Um, it has some functional groups. So there's those hydroxyl functional groups, the OHs that we just got done talking about. Uh, again, that's going to give sugar this polar properties. There's going to be some negative charges on the oxygen, some slightly positive charges on the hydrogens. Um, and what that does is it makes it water soluble. You know, I make hummingbird food for the little hummingbirds that come by my porch. So I mix a whole lot of sugar in with that water and it dissolves. It's, it's soluble. Um, and the reason for that is because the polar molecule of water can break apart the polar uh, bonds between the carbon, uh, between the glucose molecules. 
So here is our uh, little bit closer look at the monosaccharide. Um, so we have this backbone, uh, this carbon backbone. There's that glucose chemical formula. Again, it doesn't always have to have six. You can have monosaccharides of three, four, five, or six, I think usually carbon uh, skeletons, uh, carbon chains, usually found in a ring, but they can actually also be linear, like just a straight line of the carbons in a row. Um, so besides glucose, there are some other important monosaccharides that you may have uh, heard of, fructose. Uh, which you can often find in corn syrup and fruits, like high fructose corn syrup. That's it's a monosaccharide. Uh, galactose is part of that lactose disaccharide. So the milk sugar is actually two uh, monosaccharides hooked together, and one of those is galactose. Um, and then we have ribose and deoxyribose, which are five carbon sugars. They are in a pentagon shape as opposed to a hexagon shape. Um, and these are the sugars that are associated with your nucleic acids, your DNA and RNA. So deoxyribonucleic acid is the deoxyribose sugar and the ribonucleic acid is the ribose sugar. Okay, um, so when we take a look at these monosaccharides, we can either when they put, come into our body, um, we can burn them or I should say utilize, kind of extract the energy from them, uh, but we can also use them to do building, uh, as building blocks to make our own monosaccharides. So if we wanted to store them, um, we can, we start hooking them together in that dehydration synthesis, um, and we can build them up into larger storage molecules um, in these different polysaccharides. We'll see some examples of those here in a little bit. All right, so here's some specific disaccharides, uh, again, that you might be familiar with. So sucrose is our table sugar. So that is a glucose and a fructose hooked together. Lactose, which you find in milk, this is a glucose and a galactose. And then a maltose or malt sugar is glucose and glucose. So you may have been familiar with these terms before, but not quite knowing what they mean. That's all they are. Um, so lactose, if you're maybe lactose intolerant or somebody who is, you just have the inability to break down that bond between the glucose and the lactose. Um, so the lactose moves on through your system instead of getting fully digested, and that gives you all those yucky um, side effects of taking in dairy. All right, so uh, those are our monosaccharides and disaccharides. So now we're going to take a look at polysaccharides, which is you know a whole lot of these monosaccharides hooked together. Um, and there's a couple different kind of categories of these polysaccharides. Um, some of them are storage, right? They're they're good for energy, so we can store these. We um, in our body or in plants um, and other animal organisms, uh, we can store uh, sugars, store these monosaccharides by putting them into these large polysaccharide forms. So one of the forms that we usually see in plants um, is called starch. You might be familiar with starch. This is a polymer of glucose. So it's just a whole bunch of glucose molecules hooked together in these big, large chains. Um, and that's basically what you eat when you eat a carrot or a potato um, or some of these seeds um, that are very starchy. Uh, the other type of poly storage polysaccharide is called glycogen. Glycogen is found in animal tissue, primarily liver and muscle. It is a way for those tissues to store the glucose um, that may have just been processed and digested after your meal. So as you take in your food, your digestive system breaks it down, we absorb those monomers, but we can't burn them all at once, so we gotta you know, put them away for later. So we can store them and put them away for later in this form of glycogen. It's like a store, it's like a glucose pantry um, found in your liver and your skeletal muscles. All right, so here's some visual representations of those things. So on the top, we have a picture of starch uh, a little micrograph of a potato, and you can see all those little blue hexagons. Each one of those is representing an individual glucose molecule, and they're hooked together in big long chains, and there's some branching going off here and there, but it's just all glucose. And so when you eat a potato, you are eating starch, which then your body will break down to the individual molecule of glucose. So then that gets absorbed into your bloodstream, goes into your uh, tissues, and then that picture on the bottom, this big crazy looking wheel here. This is a picture of glycogen. So it is a huge storage molecule. Each one of those tiny little circles, like I'm gonna circle one right there. That is one glucose molecule. So you can imagine how much glucose we can store. So after we eat our potato, 
that gives us the glucose in the form of starch. We break that down in our digestive system. We absorb the individual monosaccharides, and then that gets carried off to our liver and our muscles. And then our, they kind of put that in our glucose pantry um, in this form of glycogen. So then later in the middle of the night, or it's been five hours since you've eaten breakfast or lunch, um, then we can start breaking some of those glucoses out of the glycogen to go and feed the rest of our body in the times between our meals. All right, um, there are some polysaccharides that serve the purpose of structure as opposed to storage. So cellulose is a polymer of glucose. Um, cellulose is found in plant cell walls. It's basically stems and wood and kind of planty stuff. Um, so that's basically all it is. There's a picture of it there on your screen showing you these big long chains. They're more linear. They're not branched like the starch was in the last slide. So it gives them this nice rigid um, structure. Um, gives plants kind of their rigidity, the ability to grow 200 feet tall when you're talking to look at, taking a look at one of those tall uh, redwood trees or so. And then the other polysaccharide um, as a structural polysaccharide is what's called chitin. Um, this is found in the cell walls of fungus and also in the exoskeleton of insects, crabs, and spiders. So kind of a weird similar characteristic that we're going to find the same polysaccharide um, in two completely different kingdoms. So we have fungus um, and animalia, both containing uh, chitin in their ex kind of protective structures. And you can see um, it's glucose, again, modified a little bit with some nitrogen in there and alternating patterns of how they're bonded together. Okay, so that was our discussion on carbohydrates, primarily for um, energy and a little bit in structure for when you're taking a look at um, plants. So our next macromolecule are lipids. Um, so lipids are also made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they don't have that very strict ratio um, to each other. They're mainly carbon and hydrogen with a lot fewer um, oxygens involved. So they're very long chains of carbon and hydrogen, which share their electrons equally. So we call these um, nonpolar, right? We've learned that word before. So nonpolar hydrocarbons are hydrophobic, water fearing. Um, so they do not interact with water very well. So as you'll notice, or you might experience, um, water and oil don't mix. And the reason why is because oil is a lipid, is a type of this macromolecule made of these big long chains of hydrocarbons that repel water because they don't have any partial charges for the water to stick to. All right, um, so they're very diverse in their function. So where carbohydrates were primarily for energy storage and use, um, lipids can also do energy storage, but they can do other things like waterproofing. They're a big part of our membranes um, in our cells and a lot of our hormones are lipid-based hormones. So this picture here of the David um, statue says, if you don't move, you get fat. So uh, we do store our, a lot of our energy in lipids, and if we take in too many more calories than we burn, our body tends to store those extra calories as fat. All right, so uh, the three categories of lipids we're going to take a look at are oils, fats, and waxes. So we're going to take a look at um, oils and fats first. So if we take a look at this picture over here, this guy right here, You'll notice you can see these big long chains of hydrocarbons. It's just carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, um, and they're all nonpolar. So this is going to be the repelling, the hydrophobic piece to this molecule. And then what we have in this gray box, or kind of this tan box here, is this is what's called a glycerol molecule. It's a three carbon chain with some hydrogens, but also has some of those hydroxyl groups, right? We talked about some hydroxyl groups. So here what we have is a little bit of polarity on that glycerol molecule. We have, okay, here's a question for you. If we're bonding three of our fatty acid chains each to that glycerol backbone and we are removing water, what do we call this? This is our dehydration. I'm just going to abbreviate synthesis, right? So that was a dehydration synthesis reaction to take our individual subunits of fatty acids 
and making these larger polymers of a what's called a triglyceride. So you may have heard of triglycerides if you've done your blood work and you check your cholesterol levels and your fat levels. That's what the doctors are looking for is how much of this free floating triglycerides you have um, in your blood. Um, so fat a lot of times is stored. So we can see the bear there in the avocado um, has lots of plant oils in there. OK, so to distinguish between an oil and a fat, what's the difference? They're all kind of the same. Well, they are all lipids, um, but there is actual a chemical basis for the difference um, between a fat and an oil. So if we take a look at the saturated fat there in the top picture, the butter is the example. We can see the glycerol. It's got the three carbon backbone. So that's the um, right there with the oxygens are red. And then we have these big, long fatty acid chains that are sticking straight off and they're straight. Here's our hydrocarbon chain right here. So it's just carbons and hydrogens and they're all single bonded. So we call this saturated because this carbon chain is saturated with hydrogen atoms. So there's no hydrogen atom missing. Every carbon is bonded to another carbon and where there's not another carbon, there is a hydrogen. So these um, fatty acids tend to be very straight and very linear. Now compare that to the oil, the unsaturated fat. Um, if you take a look, what's different is right here. Right, so there's a double bond. Now in chemistry, a single bond usually gives you a linear characteristic. When you have a double bond, it's gonna give you a kink, a little bend in your geometry. Uh, we don't have to understand why that is, just understand that it happens. And so when you have these big long fatty acid chains that have the kinks and bends in them, they can't lay flat like they can in a saturated fat. So we call these unsaturated because we're missing the hydrogens that would be here if there was no double bond. And so we have these kind of kinky bent little um, hydrocarbon chains. And what happens is those arms, if you will, cannot sit close together. So we kind of take a look at what's an oil, what's a fat when we look at it at room temperature. So if you have something that is solid at room temperature, like butter, like shortening, like lard, like animal fat, um, these are what we call saturated fats because they're solid at room temperature because they're hydrocarbon chains. Those fatty acid chains can get really close to each other and be more dense. If your uh, lipid is oil, sorry, if your lipid is liquid at room temperature, then we call it an oil because of those kinks, the, the triglycerides can't sit close together and so there's less in that volume and so that gives you a liquid um, fat, or sorry, a liquid oil. So that'll be like vegetable oil, canola oil, olive oils tend to be plant-based oils, whereas saturated fats tend to be animal-based um, fats. All right, uh, and then this last category of lipids here, we're gonna take a look at our waxes. Um, so waxes are really big. They're even bigger than these fatty acid chains. Um, and they help to do waterproofing. Uh, leaves and stems, they can help to waterproof fur in mammals um, and insect exoskeletons. And the bees have been able to use this to make their structural honeycombs. So I put, I just found a picture of different um, structures of waxes. There's beeswax, carnauba wax, and spermaceti wax, which I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, but when you're taking a look at a picture like this, it kind of looks like a big uh, hairpin. Um, but each one of these angles is representing a carbon. So carbon, 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 which is going to have hydrogen sticking off of it. So there's, we don't really see any double bonds between the carbons. We see some double bonds here with the oxygen, um, but we have these big, uh, long chains and so that's going to give it that hydrophobic characteristic that's going to be able to repel water. Okay, um, a different category, so not fats, oils, or waxes, but we have another uh, structural and functional category called phospholipids. So there's that phospho group that was one of our functional groups that we saw a little bit earlier. Um, and so if we take a look at the structure, here we have a very similar beginning, right? So we have our fatty acid chains, uh, right here, we have our glycerol backbone right here, but instead of a triglyceride, instead of three, we only have two fatty acid chains. Um, and in that third carbon spot, what we are gonna end up is with that phosphate group. 
and then uh, some kind of other functional group, uh, a big collection of charged atoms. So here's the big deal with phospholipids, is we have this part here, I'm gonna circle all the yellow bits. These are hydrophobic because they have those big long hydrocarbon tails, nonpolar bonds, no partial charges. And then here, this part of the molecule is hydrophilic, water loving, right? Because we have uh, hydroxyl groups, which are, uh, or the oxygens on the glycerol, which are going to be electronegative, kind of hogging some of those electrons. And we have our phosphate group has charges hooked to it. And we have this functional group is gonna have some charges hooked to it. And so this is going to have, since it's got charges, it's gonna be able to interact with water. But the other side, the hydrophobic side, is not going to be able to react with water. So we have this molecule that has two kind of identities. We have a hydrophobic side and we have a hydrophilic side. So why is that important? Well, it's important because this allows us to make plasma membranes. It allows us to make these physical barriers between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. So we'll see that a little bit more probably in chapter five when we dive into plasma membrane structure and function. So this is kind of our foundational knowledge um, to help us understand what, um, how these phospholipids work is because they have these two characteristic features, a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. And a lot of times you see them depicted like a, uh, like a lollipop with two sticks or maybe a balloon with two strings hanging down representing those two different regions, the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic, the head and the tail. All right, our last group of lipids are called steroids. Um, so you might be thinking steroids like uh, muscle bodybuilders, and that's kind of part of it. Um, but we have natural, you know, circulating steroids that do good things for our body. Um, but a lot of these are going to be hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. Um, those are considered steroids. We also have cholesterol, um, which is a type of a steroid that's found in animal fats um, that can, it's we need it, we need cholesterol in our diet, but we just don't want too much because it's been found to give, um, increase the risk of heart disease. Um, so here is the common theme, if you will, for these steroid uh, lipids is that they have four rings. So again, everywhere where you see a corner, that's representing a carbon molecule. So there's lots of carbons and there's gonna be lots of hydrogens. They're just not pictured here in the diagrams, but you can see they all kind of share that same basic blue part of the molecule with the variation being all of these different functional groups. So we have some hydroxyls uh, here. We have some methyl groups here. We have some more methyl groups here. Another, some hydroxyl groups down here. So we see some similarities and also some differences based on that general plan of a steroid. Okay, um, our third and probably most diverse of our macromolecules are called proteins. Um, so I'm starting off with like, what are proteins? And you have this table in your book um, that is a little bit smaller here in this new version. So this is an older picture um, on page 40. Um, table three, three, these are all the various functions of proteins. So we can have structural proteins like hair. We can have movement proteins um, like actin and myosin, which allow our muscles to contract. Um, we can have like antibodies for fighting diseases um, are proteins, storage uh, proteins, signaling proteins like insulin. A lot of our hormones and cell signalers take on a protein form and catalyzing reactions, these are called enzymes, um, very important for cell processes. They're all proteins. So I have a picture of um, hair, muscle fibers, and an enzyme. That enzyme, that blue blob there is actually amylase. Um, amylase is an enzyme that breaks starches down into individual glucose molecules. So kind of connected to what we just got done talking about. So with proteins, structure is critical. So the ability for the protein to work properly, it has to have a very specific three-dimensional shape. And the way that it does that is the way that it's formed. And it's formed by these big long chains of their monomers or amino acids. So you get hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of amino acids hooked end to end like a big pearl necklace. And it's that specific sequence of those amino acids that give the protein the ability to fold into that three-dimensional 
uh, shape. So you can see on the picture, each one of the little blue circles there has a different um, abbreviation for an amino acid, and they are in a very specific order. So if you change that sequence, the protein probably would not work. Okay, so when we take a look at these, these building blocks, they're called amino acids, so they're going to have the amine group, we'll see this nitrogen-containing group, and the acid part is representing to the carboxylic acid functional group, so we can see we have um, these functional groups coming in and giving us these particular characteristics of amino acids. So um, some of them have hydrophobic sides, some of them have hydrophilic sides, some of them are acidic, some of them are basic. Um, so there's lots of different characteristics, and there's about 20 different amino acids that can be put in this very specific sequence to allow for the protein to do that special folding and have its, have its job. So here's the basic structure. So the, the skeleton, if you will, the carbon skeleton, um, starts with this central carbon here. Okay. Sticking off of the central carbon is that one functional group. Here's our NH2, so this was our amine group. That's the nitrogen-containing group. And then over here, remember, we had a C uh, double bonded to an O and another, another O. That was our carboxylic acid group. So the amino acid is where the name comes from. So that central carbon has an amine group. It's got the carboxylic acid group. It's got a hydrogen hook to it. And then this guy right here is called the R group. This is what's different between all of the 20 amino acids. The amino group's the same, the carboxylic acid group's the same, the hydrogen's the same, but what's different is that R group. And so there's 20 different R groups that's gonna give you 20 different um, functional amino acids. So here's just an example um, of five different amino acids. So you can see that basic uh, pattern here is kind of the unshaded boxes. So here's our two carbons, you can see the hydroxyl group and the amine group um, and the hydrogen. And then what's in the green boxes, those are the variable, the R chains. And so some of them you can see functional groups here. We've got the hydroxyl. Um, we've got a ring shaped. So that's going to have a, a special characteristic in three-dimensional space. Here's that sulfhydryl group, the sulfur-containing group. Here's a couple methyl groups. So all of those functional groups that we were talking about before, we're seeing some of those show up. Um, here's our carboxylic acid, COOH. Oh, that was this one over here. Okay, so these are gonna have acidic properties. These two are going to, these two here are going to be nonpolar because they don't have any oxygen or nitrogen stealing some of those hydrogens away. And so that's gonna give them hydrophobic properties. Okay, so like I mentioned before, it is the sequence of those particular amino acids that are gonna give the protein its um, folding. So now we're gonna take a look at um, these different levels of folding. Um, but before we do that, I forgot, we have to hook these amino acids together. So here's our dehydration synthesis reaction um, that we talked about before, just like we saw making um, monosaccharides into polysaccharides making individual fatty acids into triglycerides. Now we're gonna take individual amino acids and hook them together into long polypeptides is what it's called. And this particular type of bond, it's got an actual special name, it's called the peptide bond. So whenever you hook two amino acids together, it's called a peptide bond and there's our water as the byproduct. Okay, so here's our four levels of protein structure. So just the base sequence, when you, like the bead on the string, those blue balls that are all stuck together, that's called the primary sequence. So that's just that, that very special sequence that the amino acids are hooked together. Then they're gonna fold. They can fold into kind of a spiral shape or they can fold into a zigzag shape, and this is called the secondary structure. And then those folds fold on themselves again to give you another um, three-dimensional shape, and that's called the tertiary structure. You get the kind of the pattern here, primary, secondary, tertiary. And then lastly, you have quaternary, which is you have two or more individual protein chains held together to make a very large protein. So let's take a look at a picture. I believe I have that coming up next. Yep. So here in part A, so this is our primary structure right here. 
that's a very bad arrow. Um, so this is just a particular sequence. So leucine, valine, lysine, lysine, glycine, histidine. That's that primary structure, that very special order. So then that secondary structure is, in this particular example, it's folded into a helix, like a little spiral. And so the things that are holding it together in that shape are hydrogen bonds. So you're going to have some attraction between the partial positive and partial negative charges um, holding that spiral together. All right, and then we fold it one more time. So we have this tertiary structure. And so now bonds that are going to be from, here's our helix. We might get some bonds from here to here or we might get some bonds from here to here or from here to here. And these are gonna be stronger covalent bonds, usually with that cysteine sulfhydryl containing group. Um, and so those are gonna be a lot stronger bonds. You might get some ionic bonds coming together. You might get some hydrophobic or hydrophilic interactions coming together. And so that's going to hold that tertiary shape very specifically. And then lastly, that quaternary protein, each one of those yellow blobs, this, this big blob right here, that's one protein. But to get our final product, you have four of these all kind of hooked together, and this is quaternary. This particular protein example is hemoglobin. It is the uh, protein that's found in your red blood cells that carries oxygen. So in this heme group, this is where you actually have oxygen gas bind. So when you breathe, we take in the oxygen to our lungs, it goes from our lungs into our blood, and then oxygen is going to bind and uh, saturate all of those heme units on our hemoglobin. So we have these four levels. And if there's any change to any of those levels of uh, structural organization, um, the protein may not work. Okay, so when you have a situation where the protein um, loses that three-dimensional shape, there's a special word for it. It's called a denaturing or denaturization of the protein. So that could be breaking the hydrogen bonds of that secondary structure or those um, covalent bonds or ionic bonds of the tertiary structure. But usually what happens is it loses that very special three-dimensional shape and it's not going to function properly. Um, some of the most common ways that you can denature a protein is by high heat, like you're boiling or superheating this substance. It breaks those bonds because of that temperature um, or chemical reactions like too acidic or too basic or other strong chemicals that can come in and interfere with those bonds. So here's kind of a visual representation of what that might look like. So the normal protein here, we have those spirals, then we have that tertiary or the, um, yeah, the tertiary folding giving you that normal shape. And then you have a denaturing event, could be heat, could be acid, is going to break up those bonds and you get this big, you know, just that ribbony of the primary sequence, um, and it's not going to function. It's not going to have that three-dimensional shape to allow it to do what it needs to do. Now, sometimes you might be able to renature that protein. So if you take that um, thing away, the heat or the acid or the base, if you remove that, the, the protein may fold back in on itself, but a lot of times it doesn't. So think of egg whites. I think there's an example in the book of cooked eggs there on page 43. Um, Egg white is mostly protein, it's called albumin. Um, and if you put that in a pan, the heat of the pan denatures the egg protein and you can't undenature that, you can't renature cooked egg white. So that's a permanent denaturing of that particular protein. All right, on to our last um, macromolecule. So these are nucleic acids. So nucleic acids, again, polymers, made up of their individual monomer called a nucleotide. So there's a picture of a nucleotide there on the screen. It has three major parts. We have the base, which is sometimes called a nitrogenous base because it contains lots of nitrogens. There you go, it's hard to make arrows. Um, and then we have a sugar. Um, could be a ribose sugar if you're going to make RNA or a deoxyribose sugar if you're going to make um, DNA. Um, so here's our sugar. And then we have our phosphate group. So there's that big functional group that we talked about before. So we can see a couple other functional groups. Here's uh, an amine. Here's a hydroxyl. And then here's the whole big phosphate. So again, we're seeing those functional groups in all types of these macromolecules. Okay, so there's two groups of um, nucleic acids. I've mentioned them kind of in passing. We have ribonucleotides, uh, RNA. Um, so these are used um, to kind of help out the process of taking that information that's stored in your DNA 
and making yourself have use of it, which is usually instructions for making those proteins that we just got done talking about. Um, they have four nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. Um, and they're usually single-stranded, um, so it's not a double helix like the typical DNA molecule that we see. Uh, DNA, on the other hand, is a double helix, and it has four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So the only difference between the bases there is RNA has uracil, DNA has thymine. All right, so here's just some visual representations of those two molecules where DNA is a double helix. There's the adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And the RNA is a single helix, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. And you can see some similarities between the thymine and the uracil. We're going to talk a lot more about these molecules when we get to the actual DNA chapter um, and protein synthesis and heredity. So for right now, we're just introducing what this molecule is. And I found a nice little meme there on the internet. Of course, scientists are going to focus in on her hair, where you have a single ringlet is our RNA and a double ringlet is our DNA, right? Can't get away from science, even on Game of Thrones. Um, now, those are the primary nucle uh, nucleic acids, the DNA and the RNA, but there are some smaller nucleotide kind of uh, derivatives out there that are very, very important for cellular processes. Some of them are used as intracellular messengers, so kind of like they can deliver messages within the cell. Um, this one's called cyclic AMP. Um, sometimes they are used to store energy. So the major energy currency of the cell is a molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It looks just like the nucleotide, but it's got three phosphates, one, two, three phosphate groups, um, instead of just that one. Um, and then lastly, some of these nucleotide derivatives can be um, helping with chemical reactions. They're called coenzymes or assistants. And this is one that's very important called coenzyme A. Um, so the coenzyme A is used in your um, cellular respiration processes.